Hey, what's up, everybody? Neil Denot, San Diego here, and I'm going to give you how I correct plantar fasciitis, not just the symptoms, but get rid of it for good. And I'm going to give you a quick walkthrough about what needs to be done and how uh, you should do it. And, you know, if you have any questions after that, then we can always talk more. But I'm going to start with explaining what muscular recalibration is, okay, and how we do it. So muscular recalibration really is just what it sounds like, you know, our body is always recalibrating, right? It, it It's designed that way. It, 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 even if you want to stand on one foot, it's recalibrating. It's, it's very slight, right? You know, but this is how precise the body is. At every range of motion, there's parts of the muscles that's firing for whatever reason, whether it's to uh, primarily move, whether it's to secondarily uh, absorb uh, deceleration, right? Or to counterbalance, oppose, right? So your body's working from every quadrant at one, two, three, four to move because we move in rotation and everything is is leveraging itself. And we've been given such a great machine of a body, right? Like this, like, tell me who, who made it up. I didn't, you didn't, no. But it's been around for a long time and it's been really good for a long time. And so what, what I want you to understand is that what we do in most approaches to uh, correcting injuries is we work on the symptoms but the problem lies in the systems and you're saying what what do you mean like what are we going to download well no not necessarily right so just think all the information that runs to your your body to move you send it right unless it's like involuntary like breathing and stuff you you unconsciously send it but you're not actively sending it so if you want to move you make a decision to move right so goes down to whatever it needs to go. And as you continue to move, all these things start firing synchronistically, like automatically. There's nothing you have to think about. It does it all for you. And then you get through life and you sit through things and then boom, you got your plantar fasciitis, right? And then we go, oh, I just overdid it on my calf. Yes, because your calf was the only thing doing the work, right? Because your hips weren't moving there's no shock absorption in the sequence right and yeah so all that's happening is you're i guess if you see my smack in the ground like just smacking it and that's what's happening to your foot of course it's gonna hurt and it's also a tough injury because we are on our feet all the time no well, mostly it's hard to not walk so uh what i'm gonna uh, explain real quick uh in in the easiest terms that i can uh get you to understand is that when we talk about recalibrating, you know, we all have our way of doing that. Whether it's uh, massage therapy, it's chiropractic, whether it's acupuncture, you know, these are things and they all have their tool, they're all tools and they all have their strengths. And not to say that they're weak, but they're just better in certain circumstances. Now, for example, um, chiropractic, it's better as a lifestyle than it is as an injury, in my opinion, because injury is multifaceted and it is been a long term thing developing. So let me break it down for you. So we need to mobilize the hips on somebody with, with, uh, with plantar fasciitis, right? So pretend these are my hips, right? Boom, 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 boom. As you walk, and then pretend my arms are my legs while we're at it. Boom, 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 boom. Walking, walking, walking. My elbows are my knees. Your arms are actually your legs, your upper body. Notice the similarities, but anyhow, right? Boom, 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 boom. They get closer and closer and closer and tighter and tighter, and tighter. Boom, and forward, right? Because they're already stuck forward. And then now, all these muscles that wrap around these hips are calibrating to hold what they've been taught, right? So these are no longer mobilized. So now, where this inserts into the hip, right? It's pulled higher into here because it's being, it's being dragged because it's connected, right? And it's wrapping. And then what happens is a, a change it here. And remember, this is the counterbalancing joint from here to here. So same as the leg, right? Your ankle is, is, is going to follow with the, with the femur goes into the hip. So let me simplify this a little bit more. Okay. We've, we walk in a one sided motion more than another. We favor a rotation. We're going to be spiraled, right? How much does that mean for you as a practitioner helping this? Well, it's relevant because you have to understand the relationship between counterbalancing parts, right? However, what I want you to focus on right now 
is how we can start getting these hips to lower, okay? Because as these hips lower and find their way back to here, this, well, this will, they'll sink up again and your foot, your first of all, your gait, where you're able to, be, you know, cross, uh, counterbalance and move and, and, and go through multiple planes of motion, right? Also rely, allows for the uh, skeleton to, you know, to be free, right? Because the muscles and the tendons are keeping the skeleton stuck in there. So now that what's going to do is going to restore balance, going to restore flow. So what do you have to do in order to see that happen? Well, eccentric stretching and, and, and really all it is is when you talk about muscle contraction, right? You have the concentric and eccentric phase, right? At least this muscle, this is the concentric, this is the eccentric, and while this is the eccentric, this is the concentric of the, the tricep, right? Well, if you only have one portion or two portions of the tricep, because there's three muscles, right, and one's not working, right? Firing to open up the bicep, but it's not strong enough, it won't, right? So when I say eccentric phase, on the eccentric phase, this muscle stretches this muscle open. So your biceps will not get stretched open, right? If the tricep is not working. So we look at what stopped the muscle from working rather than go to the muscle that's not working and asking it to work because it's not available to work. It's neurologically not available to work. There's not enough range for it to work. And there's players that are in the, the region that are inhibiting it. Per se. So we don't have to worry all about that right now. Okay. We're going to start from the beginning. So how do you stretch a muscle that can't be stretched by its opposing pair or its opposing partner, whatever you want to call it? Me. Great. So what happens if I force that muscle open while I'm squeezing it? The same thing happens, right? Well, it does. I'm telling you, right? So come back here. Boom, 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 boom. We go through this a few times, let's say five, and I'm doing this very slowly, about eight to 10 seconds, because you need to really focus. This is all on contraction. You're, if you're doing it to yourself, it's a little different than doing it to somebody else, but if you're doing it to yourself, you have to just focus on that muscle because, and using the other side helps to delineate between or differentiate between um, sensations, because it's really hard to feel your own contractions in a sense, because it's natural. So you do this a bunch of times, and it starts to stretch. So now, that's, it's not just one and done, right? People stretch and they stop right there. It's go, once you stretch, once you release a muscle tension, you've added strength to it, you've added range to it, and you've changed muscles in the group to start to restore their, their relationship. So think about it. We're like reversing out the injury or reversing out the tension, we'll say, right? But gotta let you know that usually the last thing that feels better is the pain. Why? Because once you've already went over the top and you've, you've crossed trauma, now your body is continually causing trauma there. So and, and until we work our way out and get them to, to balance out, at times the actual pain might not be released until the end because we don't access to the muscle to release it. So for instance, psoas muscles, right? These internal core muscles we talk about a lot. They shut down our core weakens or abdominals weakens. These are huge in our hips mobility because think about it like this. Your psoas is like five fingers, right? In the front, well, sort of. It's got five attachments and it attaches to the front of your lumbar spine, right? It comes from the front and then it tilts over and then it goes this way and these shorten because the spine is really strong. It's stronger than the muscles, Right? even though the muscles can put a hurting on it, it's really strong. So it's taking it and turning your body into the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So do we build the other direction on the Leaning Tower of Pisa or do we straighten the tower first and then build more? Well, by not straightening or recalibrating, it's essentially you're rebuilding on top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa the other way. And that's, that's only gonna last so long. We're going to pull back the other way and pull back the other way. I mean, that's really what's going to happen. So we start from the beginning, right? Hip flexor, first muscle, right? How do you stretch a hip flexor? Real simple. You pull it back. You pull the leg back. 
and you push against the thigh. If you're doing it to somebody else, you have them pull the leg back, position yourself, have them squeeze, and you pull away from the hip flexor. So now you're saying, whoa, whoa wait a second. That does, I mean, was it supposed to, was it snaps? What's going on? No. So this is a feeling and a touch that you and the client have to get used to. So it takes twice as much force to open a muscle. So really it's only a relative measurement to as to where the client is and to where you are. So you don't overpower. So you're not working like, like if you, if, if you put 50 pounds of torque on a muscle, I'm just saying, and you've got to, you got to come up with a hundred. That's a lot of work, man. Like, and that's going to hurt. The muscle doesn't have to be fully engaged to its full strength because we, we assume that the stronger you squeeze, the more fiber that's firing. And that's actually not always the case because if there's muscles shut off, it's shut off. It, it doesn't matter what you do to fire it. You're only really building the muscle that's working better by making it stronger. So you're not actually increasing the area or the amount of muscle recruiting. So whatever you need to do to separate that muscle, right? Whatever's working is gonna get separated. So, and then as you separate, things start to come back into fruition. So let me, let me break it down very simply, okay? You have a sequence of things, right? You have hip flexors and hamstrings to work together. You have quads and glutes, right? They work together, right? So inner and out of thighs, opposing muscles, right? So what I'm saying is, is that we don't just work on one muscle. We start on one muscle and the group that's tighter than the others, right? So let's say the path, we call it the path of most resistance. So if I'm here, well, this is the tighter part of my bicep. If we're my hamstring, right? It would be the outer hamstring, right? And likely you're going to notice on the other side of the hamstring, the other one's dead or not working, we'll say, right? Well, when you start stretching that overactive hamstring, it starts returning synergy to the group and actually turns that muscle back on. So why is this important? Well, we want to open the glutes. We don't open the lower back. We want to open these deep uh, core muscles, but we don't access to them. We shut access off. That core shut down. The, the connection between the hamstring to the glute, the chain, there's no, there's no even tension. Like that's why everybody's got little... You know, they get they tend to get saggy here in the bottom and a little the back of the hamstring, that area, because synergistically it's not working, right? But as we start to restore these relationships, they work. And then that opposingly will turn the, the, uh, the quads back on. So now that we have these relationships even, now the body is more capable of stretching itself without you. Yes, we have to walk through it, but we have to ignite it to stretch it. So let me tell you very simply, my my best pace, I, I very simply do it this, five, then switch sides, right? So if we're doing hamstrings, we do five, and then we switch the quads and do five. The opposing muscle. So if we're doing, if we're doing a rotate, so if we're just doing the inside, um, if we're actually rotated, we're just doing the inside hamstring, right? Because that's where we'll get the most um, contraction is during external rotation on the inside hamstring because that's, what it does. It supports external rotation and flexion. So um, if we start stretching that one, what you're going to start to see is more synergy. You're going to start to see that change the relationship with the quad as well. And that is going to affect, it's going to connect the dots. So we do quads, hamstrings, quads, hamstrings, and then they start to, and we do both sides of the body, right? So you could do them one at a time. It's better to start one at a time. Um, just so you you get a good feel that you're, 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 you understand what you're doing. And um, you're really, you and the client can really, it's a dance. You guys are going to dance and you're going to lead, but soon it's going to be a bang, bang relationship and you're going to feel it and you won't have to say a word to each other. But at the beginning, we're going to take one side and we're going to be stretching at eight to 10 seconds, that type of range, slow, negative, eccentric, right? So we, we go. And then we switch. So we're going to go to our hamstring, right? We're going to do our hamstring ten, five times. Boom. It take about a minute. And then we're going to go. And we're going to do the other side. We're going to do the quads, right? We're going to do uh, knee flexion. So we're going to go from extension to flexion. We're going to go back and forth. So we'll maybe do that. I'd say three or four sets before switching sides. You don't have to do one, one set left, one set right. Um, however, 
if you're just learning and you just want to get a feel for it, um, I would I would just simplify it and do one side at a time. Um, you know, but as you get down the road, you, you know, as you start to move these people along, you, they can endure more. Um, and it's it's in in my experience necessary because all that work got our bodies there. All this work is going to bring our bodies back, but it's going to happen faster because we have traction, right? At the point where it needs to be released the most. So that's like what people will go in. So we'll go in and we'll, we'll maybe ART that point or we'll go, you know, cross fiber or something like that. We'll go work on that point. But that just changes the relationship so we can continue the work and it might move. It will move the focus, of, of what's firing or what's dominating that movement pattern. And, and ultimately, as we start bringing everything back together, things will, will, will line up all on their own. Like, let me, it, we're essentially reversing this out. And when we do it, it's just like training, right? We have to do everything evenly. So we don't say, well, this side's higher, so I'm gonna work that one more. No, we, we, when we lift weights, we use the same weight until both sides catch up. That's what has to happen here. So it'll, there's no number of set times this is going to happen. Everything that you've done in your life has brought you to this point and brought your clients to this point. But the further we get away from here, right? Locked up and forward, right? And the more we get to square, it's going to be the unraveling. And you're not going to do, like, it's not going to be this whole crazy, like, you know cracking and you know this and that and jumping on people's back i mean i don't know what i said but whatever it, it's, it's just gonna be it's gonna be time of working these muscles until they're ready and you gotta remember one other thing too they're scar tissue muscles and scar tissue is designed to be broken up all on its own and actually bob cooley states in uh his book the genius of flexibility um i think it was a later version that i forgot the the, the volume but it says the human hand doesn't possess enough torque to actually break up deep scar tissue. It's not strong enough. But our muscles are. That's what they're designed to do. Normally, through expansion and contraction, we break up the scar tissue. You know, we heal. But what happens when that shuts down? Boom. Scar tissue stays there, right? And it, it, it inhibits signal, it inhibits lymphatic fluid, and it, it, it holds toxins. So, so we go and we go and we work on that area hoping to wake that area back up. But you gotta realize, that area didn't go to sleep by itself. It's not in the, like muscles don't work independently by themselves, right? They, they follow commands based on the relationship that they belong in the team. So it's like, it's like an offensive line, right? You know, it's like, uh, you got everybody's supposed to go where they're supposed to go, right? But like in the body, one can't go here if this one doesn't go there. It has to happen. It's finite. There's no, there's, there's some degree of variance of what we could do because we all have different ranges of motion. We're all built a little differently in different athleticism. However, if it doesn't go up, it's not going up because something else isn't letting it go up, the counter resistance. So the calibration is so far off that it, it can't move the way we want it to. And the way we want it to is to get rid of the pain. And then on top of it, we're on the feet so much, right? That it's hard for the symptoms to go away. So really, the, the foot can't begin healing until that chain is corrected, okay? So and as I've mentioned before in other videos, the calf, we want to stretch the calf, right? But here's the deal, right? If this is our ankle joint, our foot, right? Tibia, fibia, right? Right? And so all of a sudden, the calf is tight, but the structure is unavailable to move. Why? Well, just because the shin's weak doesn't mean it's not tight, right? Part of it's tight. One of them's weak, one of them's on. Just probably like your calf. One of them's weak, one of them's on, right? And there's going to be a degree of variability, right? Normally, the tension should be 50-50. It's probably skewed in some way like that. Just like a relationship in the body. So, when we talk about opening up the foot and the ankle, right? We have to work on the shin first, right? Because if the shin doesn't come down, the calf can't come down. It's not a one and done paint by number thing. As a whole, we wind in, right? And this whole limb here winds in, right? Because my leg, right? And pff, what do these tendons in the foot do? They pull and you get these crowed feet drops. 
shock absorption shops the uh the arts of planter's fascia right it's it's just overstretched there and then you're trying to stretch the calf without any connection or any ability to pull at the calf because structurally your shin is blocking you it's it, it, it the ankles this whole relationship here so when you stretch against the shin right just like i'm doing just like i explained to you the other muscles you're going to start stretching one of those tibialis, shin tibialis, and they're going to start to, to meet up, meaning they're going to start to share the responsibility again. So you back one muscle out, and the, two, and the, the other group, they start to synergize, right? What does that do? It releases the front of, of, the, of the tissue, the, the musculature. That now allows it to begin to be stretched better. Because now, remember, when you change this relationship, this relationship changes too. So it turns more of the actual uh, calf on. Because there's a part of the calf that's, that's tight, but there's part of the calf we can't reach because we don't connect the dots. So now that this is stronger, we can stretch the calf. And that's going to help the ankle joint expand. Yes. Movement, mobility at the ankle joint is important for plantar fasciitis. Allowing your feet to um, flatten or to, you know to not not be so tight and for them to uh, strike the ground more evenly is important at curing plantar fasciitis. However, you can't change this until you change the hips. You can change it, but you're not going to get what you need to complete or fix it. Now, some of you might be saying to me, "Well, I've done this before, and um, yeah." And I didn't do all that, and it worked. Good. I'm happy. That's fantastic. Um, everybody's in a different place. Because just because you have plantar fasciitis doesn't mean that other methods won't work. I'm just explaining to you what I know that works all the time on everybody. So if it's not broke, don't fix it. But if you're not getting the results you want, then this approach is going to get it for you. And I tell you, 10 years of correcting exercise, cross fiber friction, you name it, this, Y, Z, boom, nothing fixed my shoulder until this method was used on me. And once I understood how this is what just said, I've explained it to you, and it's going to take practice because right now you're going, what is this? This doesn't make sense. I'm going to tell you right now, this is what you need to do. There's a sequence, right? You know, hamstrings, quads, inner outer thighs, glutes. Find a way to stretch those in that sequence, right? Five, 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 right? So you have hamstrings, quads, boom. Inner outer thighs, right? Boom. And you have hip flexors, you know, glute max and low back, right? There's a relationship between those two. So you follow the sequence to the core, to the bigger muscles, right? or to the, the muscles closest to the spine. And then as we do that, we just start unraveling everything. It'll happen. If it doesn't happen now, keep doing it. It will happen, I promise you. Now, I must tell you that this will make your client sore, like muscle sore, like workout sore. So here's the important thing to remember when doing this with them and explaining to them. There's so much is too little and there's so much is too much, right? So um, the most important thing is not to fry them on the first time. You know, basically, don't we don't need to do this for 45 minutes. Um, if they're elderly and they've never been through a workout before, you know, maybe a half hour, start them off with, right? However, I would stay away from doing something short unless you're just um, giving somebody a, a demo. Because what happens is, what if you just stretch one quad, right? Or one uh, hamstring group. And then all of a sudden... You know, or you don't get enough and then they get out of there and then something happens, they sit around way and then it, it triggers something else. Because because you were you were maybe not overzealous or thought they're early enough, right? So what I'm saying is as long as you follow the sequence and you do it evenly enough, you're not going to get somebody stuck in a bad position. But you know, if we just if we just do the typical way and we go, oh, it's just his hamstring and I stretch the crap out of my hamstring and nothing else, you may find that that's too little. That's what I mean. So for the foot to fully heal. Once the hips are restored, it'll begin to heal on its own. Why? Because there's function back to the foot. Yes, it's going to provide more blood flow to the foot because the extremities have weak 
uh, blood flow to begin with, weak circulation. So they're already, you know, up the creek, kind of speak, so to speak, right? So once that happens, you know, anything that's going to ice your foot, your, it's, it's, the inflammation has to go away. Rest it as much as they can, ice it, but most importantly, restore it so it can heal on its own. It wants to do this. Once you reconnect the dots, your brain, your nervous system, they never forget. We might forget, our conscious may forget, but does your brain ever forget to, to, to breathe? I hope not. So if it forgets to breathe, right, we're dead. So who says it forgot to move, right? How, how, what, what happened to the move? What happened to the limbic system? Like, what, what happened to all this? Like, did it just, did it just disappear? Is it just faulty? No. The, it, the, the thing is, is that your, your nerves are not getting to where they got to go. Like, the message's not getting to the muscle. Why? Because they're shut off. Hello? Hello? Nobody's there. But why do we continue to ask them to do something when you can't even get to the front door? So, it's my fun spin on it. So listen, real simple. Wherever the, the, the muscle wants to go first, meaning like if you ask them to bend your leg and it goes out to the side, that's the, that's the most active part. If it goes this way, that's the most active part. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to just listen to the body. Look at it. When you ask it to move, it's going to tell you it wants to go. I mean, a physical assessment of a squat even is going to tell you, you're going to look, oh, oh this, this stops here, this changes here. But if I bend my arm and it does this, well, I guess it's internally rotated, right? And this is the, the path of most resistance for me. So that's what I'm going to start. But very simple. If you don't know where to start, you're not sure, it's real simple. Do each muscle the same amount. So meaning if it's the, the hamstrings, three directions, you get internal, external, straight. Same goes for the quads, right? Just do all, every every single muscle on its own, the same amount until they all meet up. And you're going to find it. It's going to happen sooner than you expect. And it's got more powerfully. And once we connect these dots, again, that gives us access to our, our glute max because our glute max, we don't have the access to it. Why? Because it's shut off on the bottom. And when we get traction all the way to the back, if we don't get that big bulky part of the glute max and we get it at the right angle at times, right? Because glute max is the diagonal, runs diagonal, right? So we have to change our, anyhow, that's another, that's another uh, tip we go over another time. But the thing is, is if we, we don't have access to glute max, we don't access to the lower back. And we can't open the sacrum. Why? Because the piriformis is shut off. Just like your subscapularis, your rotator cuff is because the hips are too high. These hips, the glute max, they need to lower the hips, which turns on the lower portion of the pelvic floor muscles. And then we can get ab adductor stretches. No, abductor stretches, excuse me. I'm confusing myself. Abductor stretches that will allow us to pop the sacrum, pop the SI joints, the piriformis. You want to stretch these IT bands, these piriformis, but... They're not available to be stretched. You're stru structurally impossible to get the stretch you want on it. So the idea is we're putting the body back to where it can be manipulated by itself. Meaning we don't have to address it. So once we connect the dots, everything does it all on its own. So I know there's a lot of information there. I know I've said it a few times. So I hope that through repetition, it makes sense. You might just have to just say, hey, go give it a shot. Practice. Look, I'm not telling you if you do five, one stretch on somebody, you're going to hurt them, right? No, right? But I mean, don't spend 15 minutes just working on somebody's hamstring. That just doesn't make sense. You want to just train somebody's hamstring for what, 15 minutes, right? So it's really it's really all you you would logically use for, for strength training, right? Except the opposite. And you're in charge of it. So with that said, I appreciate this time. Um, I, it's really important for me to get this out there because I myself had plantar fasciitis and it took, it took me out of everything, you know, uh, you know, with, with good, uh, with all things good, it, um, had I not hurt myself, I want to be talking to you from sunny San Diego right now, because I was planning, I was training, I was literally halfway towards a half Ironman and my foot banged up. There's nothing I can do to get rid of it. And you know what? I set my sights for here. And when I got here, it got worse. And until I was able to meet my friend and mentor, who originally helped me and taught, and taught me, helped my shoulder when I first met her, um, I couldn't get my hips totally corrected because there was just a leverage that I couldn't do. 
And she said, to, she also, your tailbone is twisted because you know why? <sighs> Hips kind of go up that way and your body kind of goes up that way and we become this like S, you know? I mean, it's not as bad as somebody would say scoliosis, but it happens. But we only see balance because that's all our body senses. So we look at it and it doesn't look terribly out of balance because if it wasn't, we wouldn't be standing up straight. So <clears throat> give it your, give it, give it some time, give it some attention and just have this time with your client. Let, just let them focus on what you're doing and the two of you together are going to work on this together. And once you, once you get that rhythm, you're going to make them, you're going to make them be able to dance again. And you're going to be able to run again. You may be able to do whatever it is. Because that plantar fasciitis is going to go away. Okay? Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate this. Namaste.